All right, hello, hello. I'm gonna get started very, very soon. All right, I wanna make sure that we are recording. The recording is gonna be sent out afterwards. So if you have to uh, drop off due to time constraints, uh, we are definitely gonna be sending out the recording. But you will want to stick around because like I mentioned, there is a special hack that we have for people who have been looking to increase their restock limits. Doesn't necessarily work for everybody, but um, it has worked for several different sellers. So we're gonna be covering that. All right, we've got a couple of other people uh, putting into the chat, trying to understand inventory limits. I've been over limit since spring and cannot send in inventory since spring. That's really frustrating. All right, yeah, we're definitely gonna be covering some of those things. And then um, is there a way to integrate our inventory levels into our marketing campaign? Just we're definitely talking about that as well. Um, it's really important to make sure that your inventory and your marketing teams are working together. So all of that is gonna be covered. All right, if you have questions as we go along, type them into the chat, but we will be doing a Q&A at the end as well. Let me go ahead and <clears throat> share screen. All right, so we are covering inventory strategies to scale even in 2021. Even with all of the craziness that has been going on, um, we are going to be working on what are those systems that you need to have in place to be able to ensure that you are you know, able to get inventory into Amazon. And when you do have some of these problems such as uh, going out of stock, what are those things to do to avoid having them plummet? So uh, we're gonna be talking about it from the logistics aspect, marketing, and also inventory planning for storage type limits. Make sure we're resuming the share. All right, so what we're gonna cover. So we're gonna talk about why inventory management is more important than ever. Um, and then I'm gonna share a little bit about myself, who I am, how I got here, why I'm talking to you about inventory management and uh, what my background is. And the key inventory forecasting and tracking systems that you need to develop uh, to have a good inventory plan uh, now and into the future. And then three triggers for how to, uh, three triggers, triggers to pull to avoid restock limit crashes during stockouts. Because if you are stocking out or if you do have those eventual stockouts that are occurring for a lot of people, what are those things that you need to do or those, um, those kind of levers to pull to be able to avoid crashing your restock limits because stockouts do tend to crash your restock limits. And then uh, as a bonus, what I, I promised before, the restock limits hack that some sellers have been using to double their limits overnight doesn't work for everyone, but has worked for uh, several different sellers that have tried it. So it's something that I think is gonna be very valuable for you guys. And that'll be towards the end of our talk. And then we're gonna talk about a solution uh, to help you to implement these systems quickly and easily. Uh, that's something that we're going to be covering at the end and then question and answer time, of course, at the end. So um, we'll just kind of get into it a little bit about me. I've been selling on Amazon since 2014 and um, I launched so stocked in 2019. The reason that I launched so stocked was because I myself was having inventory management problems and was having a hard time um, getting those things under control. So I went to look for a system and found that the systems that were available out there didn't really work well. They didn't make sense for my business. They worked for some SKUs, not for others. And started asking around to uh, people in my mastermind groups, what were they, they using? And uh, the answer kept coming back that nothing seemed to work right. Um, and everyone was going back to spreadsheets. So that was when I realized that, you know, if something can be done in a spreadsheet, why can't it be done in a software? There are, these software tools were being built um, incorrectly if a spreadsheet was a better alternative. So I dove into inventory management and I actually connected up with Dan Fernandez. He's the co-founder of Thomason.com. And we connected up, he's a serial software builder. I'm an Amazon seller and uh, since, launching in 2019, we've worked with hundreds of six, seven, and eight figure sellers. I've personally uh, worked with 
these sellers to be able to implement best practices into their business and to implement those into the so stocked tool that we've built. So now I've spoken on many different podcasts and that is one of the passions of mine is to help other Amazon sellers to get a handle on their inventory management to save a lot of money by avoiding stock out and by avoiding overstocking. And that has been, again, more important than ever due to the restock limits and the supply chain chaos that we're all experiencing due to COVID. All right, so we're gonna talk about inventory best practices. That's the first thing that we're going to cover. And these are all things that should be implemented into your business and implemented um, as quickly as possible, right? <clears throat> uh, so the first thing I wanted to talk about is adjusted velocity. Adjusted velocity is um, the concept of using not just monthly sales totals, but looking at your sales averages and figuring out what your daily sales average is, removing things like sales spikes and stockouts. So that is extremely important. You can either use your averages. So for example, 30 day average, 60 day average, 90 day average, um, or you can use last year's sales. But when you use last year's sales, you need to be able to analyze that data. And just pulling last year's sales doesn't necessarily do that. You have sales spikes that have occurred in the last year that maybe you're not going to occur again. Things like if you're mentioned in you know, the Martha Stewart, uh, a Martha Stewart uh, promotion, for example, for, you know, um, Black Friday, uh, that would be an example of something that would not potentially happen next year, right? Another thing that has happened to everyone is Prime Day, right? Prime Day is something that occurred and um, it occurred in October of last year. This year, it did not occur, it's not going to occur in October. So we know that prime day sales spikes are things that have to be removed. So if you haven't analyzed your data and removed those sales spikes from your calculation, you could be over ordering. Another thing would be stock outs. If you stocked out for a week in the last Christmas holiday and you didn't factor that into your equation, you could be under ordering. So adjusted velocity is something that is very much needed to be able to better analyze your data, right? So eliminating stockouts, eliminating sales spikes, and also eliminating things like deep discounts. So that's, those are some, some things that you need to have working within your system. And, and if you're, you don't have a system to track it, now would be a good time to, to track those, those events, right? Um, lastly would be growth trends. So one of the things that we have uh, inside of SoStock that I recommend everyone put in place is a way to figure out how much your business is growing or how much your sales are growing on a per SKU basis uh, year over year or say quarter over quarter, depending on how quickly your business moves. All right, the next thing I wanted to talk about is buffer stock. And I usually say that this is something that um, you should be implementing into your business. If there were one thing that you implemented into your business, buffer stock would be my, my top recommendation for the thing to implement. Uh, this is something that essentially it acts as a false zero. It's, um, you know, if you imagine, let's say, you know, you're driving in your car as an example, and the empty light turns on. Well, you know that you still have enough gas to get to the gas station. So you don't necessarily have to uh, worry about running out of gas before you get to the station. That empty light is kind of like a buffer stock. So that's what you have to kind of think of with buffer stock. It's the little bit of extra inventory to get you to, to, get you to the finish line without running out of stock. So this is something that um, you could do in units, but our best recommendation is to do it in number of days. So here's a couple of guidelines for buffer stock. Buffer stock is, you know, helps to cover you in case anything goes wrong. So for example, you know, you have a delay at the port. That would be a good reason to have some uh, additional buffer stock. Another one would be if Amazon is taking forever to check in your inventory. Well, if you had an extra buffer stock, 
uh, at FBA, you would be sure not to run out of stock because you kept track of that. Uh, so gu guidelines would be the longer the lead time or transfer time, the higher your buffer stock should be. And your buffer stock can be in uh, FBA uh, and your warehouse. So you can have a combination of extra buffer stock at FBA and then extra buffer stock at your third party warehouse. Uh, and like I mentioned, setting your buffer stock in number of days is more valuable to you than in number of units because a product may move 300 units in a month on your slow season, but then in your higher season or your more, uh, your more seasonal period of time, it may move something like you know, 300 units in 10 days. So those are the things to keep in mind when you're setting your buffer stock setting it with a system that that adjusts based on number of days or based on your daily velocity right your daily adjusted velocity um, is going to be more valuable than setting it in total units um, the last thing i wanted to bring up with buffer stock is that you can tend to um, amazon has an algorithm it's called geo ranking and so you can tend to for example uh, lose a one day prime badge. Some products have one day prime shipping badges and there have been sellers who've actually lost that badge when they have not had enough inventory in stock. So if you don't have enough inventory dispersed throughout the entire country, you can get into a habit of, um, or you can get into a pattern of your sales slowing down because Amazon is decreasing your ranking in the areas where you don't have enough inventory to send, uh, say, two day prime shipping. And so uh, geo ranking then can affect your, uh, your total sales. And that's something that buffer stock can help you to avoid. So we like to say that a good rule of thumb is never going below 30 days of stock. And the higher the possibility of delays, the larger your buff buffer stock wants to be. So it's something that you have to balance. Uh, but if you, for example, are doing uh, LTL shipping, it might be something higher in the say 45 days because Amazon is taking a long time to check in a lot of those LTL shipments, right? It's usually taking say, you know, three weeks just to get an appointment and then another three weeks to check in. So that's definitely more than 30 days worth of buffer stock that you would need. All right. And again, if you have questions, do post them inside of the chat or inside of the Q&A. Um, I will address them here if they are relevant to this time, and I will save them to the end if they are more relevant to, uh, say, you know, the end of the uh, webinar. All right. So then I want to talk about min-max restocking. So first we have adjusted daily adjusted velocity, and that's simply the way that you're looking at your, your velocity, right? How are you analyzing your velocity, and you're, are you making sure to account for any of these kind of anomalies that would throw off your data? And then we have the buffer stock, which is the minimum amount you want to always keep in stock. And now we have, uh, building on top of that, min-max restocking which is a combination of buffer stock and a maximum stock. Uh, I like to give the example of where I actually first learned about min-max restocking. And that was when I did a tour of a warehouse that does print-on-demand books. Now, they, because they do print-on-demand books, they always have to keep their ink in stock and they always have to keep their, um, their paper in stock, these big reams of paper that they have. So they put them on a weighted system and they have a minimum weight and a maximum weight. When the ink, for example, gets to the minimum weight, they reorder it to the maximum weight. And then they use it through to the minimum weight, then they reorder it to the maximum weight. And that way they can always stay in stock without overstocking on their ink and paper materials. So that's the same concept that we have here. It's something that we have implemented into the SoStock system. You can set a minimum and a maximum. And this is something that is extremely valuable for being able to streamline your systems and to be able to pass your inventory tasks off to VAs. Because if you don't have a system, you're always doing something by gut. Some people answered that they are doing everything inside of their head. Well, if you have everything inside your head and you don't have systems to pass on to your assistants or your inventory managers, you're never gonna get rid of the inventory job. And you probably more honestly are 
more interested in, in the marketing side of things. So figuring out things like min-max restocking is a great way to be able to pass that task on. We did have <coughs> a couple of comments in the, in the chat. Um, let's see, just take a quick look, see if there's anything relevant that we wanna answer here. Um, could you also explain why did this happen? If you have an idea or anyone here, if you can repeat that question of why did this happen, I'm not sure uh, what that question, what that was pertaining to, that would be great. Um, best way to take care of velocity. When, yes, yeah, so we're gonna cover all of these things. I'm gonna circle back to these questions. Um, and we're gonna take care of all of those questions uh, at the end. Amazon reducing the stock for sellers. Um, okay, yeah, I can definitely cover some of these things. I'm not gonna be able to answer all of the reasons why Amazon does what it, what it does, um, but I will be able to give some insight into what you can do to help boost your restock limits and uh, some of the hacks that uh, are being used, one of the hacks that is being used um, and what are those things that some people don't know actually uh, affect restock limits and affect sales velocity. Um, okay, so we're going to cover real quick uh, the benefits of min-max restocking. So using min-max restocking allows you to optimize your inventory levels, reduce your stockouts with the minimum, uh, reduce your high uh, FBA storage fees, also reduce any inventory that you're sending into, into Amazon uh, to make sure that you are able to continue to send your best sellers. I know some people are having trouble with a bunch of stale inventory being at Amazon that's blocking them from sending their best sellers into Amazon. And then of course, like I said, systemizing to be able to delegate to a VA. All right, then we have lead times and transfer times. Lead times and transfer times are another important component to your inventory management. So if you have it in a, in a very recent time, contacted every, every individual across your supply chain, every business across your supply chain and gotten new lead times and transfer times, that would be very important to do. Um, even if you have done it recently, if you haven't done it for fourth quarter, that would be an important thing to do. So that means contacting every supplier and asking them, what are their production times? How long does it take? There have been suppliers who have been taking twice as long. And so sellers will go and place their orders for Christmas and find that it's actually taking quite uh, twice as long just to produce the inventory. So if you don't have your Christmas orders in, I would say you need to get those in as soon as possible and, um, and find out if there are going to be any delays on the production side of things. Then we have the freight forwarding side of things. Uh, it's important to talk to your freight forwarder, make sure that you guys have a plan for how to move your goods and when they can arrive, if they can arrive on time or not. And if you have to do any express shipping, if that's possible at all, um, make sure that you are talking with them regarding that. And also make sure that they're able to be by coastal. For example, if there's a freight forwarder who only moves stuff into the West Coast ports and the West Coast ports are tied up, you don't want to be scrambling to try to find someone to bring something into the East Coast port or worse, have your stuff sitting out there waiting for weeks on end outside of the port to be able to uh, check to check in. So knowing that your freight forwarder has the flexibility to do West Coast or East Coast importing uh, would be very important and, and that they and feeling confident that they are paying attention to those things. Right. So having those conversations, and then lastly, the warehouses, finding out from your warehouses, how long does it take to transfer stuff from the warehouse to get it into Amazon, and finding out how much it is for LTL, but also how much it is for uh, small parcel delivery. How long does it actually take them from the point you place your request for transfer to the point they actually get it out the door, and how long has it been taking for LTL versus small parcel delivery? So those are all things to know so that you know what the possibilities are with your lead times and your transfer times, and you're not surprised by how long things are going to be taking towards this fourth quarter. <clears throat> um, and then there's a question here. Is there a way to speed up the process of receiving goods at the Amazon end? 
the best way to speed up that process at this point is doing um, doing small parcel delivery. I know that's not you know the most cost effective thing, but um, and this is something that I will go into more detail at the end. But doing small parcel delivery or having that as an additional lever to pull would be um, extremely valuable. So if you're sending most of your stuff to LTL, you might need to kind of push some stuff, uh, small parcel delivery as well if you are at risk of stocking out. Uh, time difference between lead times and transfer times. So lead times and transfer times, the difference between lead times and transfer times um, are simply, those are just terms that we that we use inside of the so stock system. Lead times refers to uh, any orders that you're placing with your supplier. And then transfer times refers to any, and any transfer request from your warehouse into Amazon. So that's just the, the difference in what I mean by lead times versus transfer times. And it's gonna vary based on, you know, where you're importing, if you're importing overseas versus if you're importing in the US um, and where your warehouses are. So I can't really say what the, what the, uh, oh, what, I can't say what the difference is between those times, but I can say that that's the distinction that we have set is lead times are with your suppliers orders and transfer times are with the warehouse uh, transfers. <clears throat> All right, and someone had asked about um, how to get inventory and marketing to, to work together. This is one of those very important things. Your inventory team and your marketing team need to be working together uh, now more than ever. So uh, I like to say that a good marketing plan turns bad real fast if it's so successful that it causes a stock out. <clears throat> right, so marketers used to be very focused on marketing um, the best sellers and pushing revenue. Now they have to market across the entire catalog and have to be responsible for moving slow sellers and sale, uh, stale inventory out of Amazon. I think we're all very aware of that, but I don't know if the if your systems have been pushed in that direction quite yet. Um, but that's that's where a lot of people are finding that they're starting to get backed into a corner where they're getting less and less uh, inventory of uh, allow, allowed into Amazon, and yet their stale inventory has not been pushed or not been moved out of there. So we'll talk a little bit about. What are some things that you can do to better coordinate this team, uh, these two teams? And what are some things that the marketing team has to take responsibility for to help in this process? All right, so uh, some vital marketing coordination points. Um, one of them would be that you, the marketing team has to give its marketing plans to the inventory team so that the inventory team can see if this is going to be a viable plan and, and essentially vet out the inventory against the marketing plan. Uh, that's something that is very important to do. And I actually have, um, I can send it at the end when I send the replay, but I have an inventory, uh, we call it an inventory minded marketing planner. And it's something that allows the marketing team to uh, get all of that information onto a, a sheet and send it to the inventory team. So that's something that you guys can, can have at the end. Again, it's an inventory minded marketing planner and that's where everything should start on a marketing side, on the marketing side of things. Here's what the plan is. You'll get a, you know, a marketing idea from an event that you go to or a, a virtual webinar that you attend and then you'll go and implement it and it'll cause a stock out. It'll actually cost you more than if you hadn't implemented it at all. It'll be, you know, the, the stock out, it will be the lost inventory space, uh, as well as any air shipments that you might have to do, re-ranking costs, and then the cost of what the marketing plan entails. So if you did any, you know, PPC campaign, or if you did any coupon discounts, all of those things cost money. If you're paying an agency and the agency stocks you out, you just pay that agency to run you into a stock out. So those are things to keep in mind. Each warehouse, I have a quick question here. Each warehouse should have its own transfer time. When will we see that in so stock? Yeah, we're definitely working on that. Um, the uh, individual transfer times per warehouse, we definitely have that on our, on our upcoming uh, features list. <coughs> Oops. 
All right, the other things to keep in mind, um, inventory uh, reports that need to be put together and sent to the marketing team, a stock out risk report. So that's anything that could potentially stock out if it's running close to being stocked out. That data is important for the marketing team because the marketing team could potentially shift what they're doing on a marketing, the marketing side of things and potentially avoid that stock out. So that's something to, for the inventory team to provide. Um, and that would be looking into the future and seeing at what point does this run out of stock and when are we getting more stock in for this product? And then there's the slow seller report. That would simply be just something that you, you put um, a, a qualifier on, right? Anything, for example, you say anything that's selling less than 20 units a day, that goes on the slow seller list. It's selling less than 20 units, but more than five units. This is the slow seller list. So that's something that uh, SoStock has the ability to create, but something that you, of course, could create yourself with filters um, inside of a spreadsheet, for example, right? Wanting you to know the the ways to put these things together. So you would have a slow sellers report, you'd have a liquidation report. Liquidation would be something where you have, a, it's very slow, maybe it's selling less than five units a day or whatever makes sense for your business. And then um, it maybe it has a lot of inventory as well. It's something where you just have to get rid of it. You're not gonna restock it. You're gonna just get rid of it. And then there's the overstock report. Uh, for example, anything over 90 days worth of inventory that is sitting either at Amazon or you can do it for, you know, Amazon plus your third party warehouse, and that would be considered your overstock report. And all of these reports are things that should be um, able to be actionable so that the marketing team can make plans, not just for, you know, pushing the best sellers, but for also clearing out some of these products that are causing problems or will cause problems in the future. So if your marketing team hasn't been tasked with being proactive about getting rid of some of these, um, this aged inventory, that's something that they need to now be doing. All right, so we're gonna talk about um, Amazon's new storage type limits. I know this is something that you guys have, uh, most of you guys have come here looking for answers on. So we're gonna go through this and then if any of the questions are not answered uh, from this, we will definitely be uh, circling back at the Q&A. All right, so Amazon, Amazon never intended to be a storage facility. They always intended to be a distribution center. And more and more over the years, they've become a storage facility and they're trying to change that. And that's part of why Amazon is doing what they're doing. They realize that they can't grow to the extent that they want to grow if they don't get the inventory in check. They've tried things like raising prices on, um, on aged inventory and that doesn't seem to work. So these restrictions are actually working a lot better. They did ASIN type limits before and now we have storage type limits. And a lot of people um, tend to, a lot of people tend to see uh, storage type limits as something really bad, right? We all thought this was gonna be a great thing for about a minute and then we all got crippled by the limits and it actually caused us to, you know, to have uh, a reverse effect where we realized that storage type limits are not um, not beneficial, right? We wished for uh, ASIN type limits. But one of the things that I want to talk about is what are the benefits of storage type limits? So we're going to be covering that a little bit because um, there are things that you can do with storage type limits that you can't do with ASIN type limits. And it actually gives us a little bit of an advantage over the ASIN type limits. And I know we have some questions in the Q&A. We'll definitely get to those. How many? Okay. Um, so let me go ahead and continue with our screen share. All right. So the first thing I want to talk about is how Amazon calculates sell through. Sell through is an extremely important metric. So if Amazon wants to be a distribution center and they want to move inventory, and that's their number one goal is to move inventory profitably, uh, it, sell through is the number one metric that should be focused on right, or that Amazon focuses on. And if you look at the inventory performance index and you look at those four different points, 
uh, involved in inventory performance index, they all in part or in whole have to do with sell through. One of those points is sell through. Another point is excess inventory. Uh, another point is the um, stock out, right? If you're stocked out, you can't sell through inventory. And then the last one is stranded inventory and stranded inventory obviously cannot be sold through because it's stranded. It's connected to a listing that is not live, right? Or it's connected to a lit or it's not, or you're not allowed to sell on that listing, whatever it is. So Amazon calculates sell through. This is their actual definition from Seller Central. So your FBA rolling 90 day sell through rate is the number of your units sold and shipped over the past 90 days divided by the average number of units available at fulfillment centers during that time. So if you've ever seen your sell through number and you really didn't understand what it meant or how it was achieved, this is how it is achieved. So if you look at what did you sell and ship within 90 days, and then you look at, you divide that by the average units available, then that's going to equal your sell through rate. So if you sell nine 9,000 units in 90 days, but you only keep 3,000 units, then that it would be a monthly turnover or a sell through rate of three. So conversely, if you sold 9,000 units and you held 9,000 units, you would have a quarterly turnover or a turnover every three months and your sell through would be one. So if you know what your sell through rate is, or if you have seen it inside of Seller Central, this would give you a better idea of how it's being achieved. All right, so utilization. This is how utilization is calculated. Utilization has a lot to do with sell through rate and a lot to do with what Amazon's allowing us to send in uh, based on what our restock limits are. So that being said, it's important to understand how utilization would be calculated. So you've got FBA available inventory, then you have all incoming shipments. And this is the surprising one, working shipments are calculated inside of utilization. This is something that we discovered and that you could actually find on Seller Central um, in, in their documentation that all incoming shipments are considered as part of utilization even working. We didn't really understand that before, that working was a part of this utilization um, until we started diving into building the new restock limits tool that we just launched. So, and then you have unfulfillable inventory. That inventory is also attributed to utilization until it's sent back to you, right? So if you have a system of sending unfulfillable inventory back to you, um, you might want to, to speed up that process if you're having some trouble with uh, unfulfillable inventory being part of your utilization quantity. Pending removal orders are not part of that um, and reserve inventory is not included surprisingly. So here we go uh, back to the relationship with between sell through and utilization. So it's the same formula that we had before, but if you look at your average units available uh, and consider that as your average utilization, you'll see why utilization and sell through have a lot to do with each other. So things like deleting shipments that you're not using, um, sending in shipments uh, more frequently, more often, not having you know, a, a shipment in transit for say 45 days, like some of us are or have been doing, those types of things will affect your sell through rate. Those types of things will affect your utilization. So, you know, uh, considering kind of shifting the logistics side of things so that you have shorter, smaller orders more frequently. All right, so now let's gonna talk about um, avoiding stockouts and restock limit crashes. I think that this section is going to be um, the section that is probably quite enlightening to you guys. And uh, the, some, of, some people know that restock limits are uh, affected by, by certain aspects of um, fulfillment and some people do not. So we're gonna kind of dive into that. All right, so the first thing I wanna talk about is the golden rule, never let anyone have all your stuff. I think this is extremely valuable. And when I talk to sellers even now, 
I tend to find that they're stalking out because they're violating this golden rule. <clears throat> and what I mean by never let anyone have all your stuff is simply don't put, don't put all your stock in one basket, right? Uh, if you have to send things to Amazon, we've had people who have sent all their inventory to Amazon, then Amazon loses that inventory. We've had where a, someone puts everything on a boat and then that boat gets delayed. And what this causes is it causes you not to have any wiggle room. You may have a ton of inventory, but it gets stuck somewhere. So if you're putting something on a ocean freight and there is a chance that it may be delayed or may be late, you should have a backup to send by Air Express if that is at all feasible for you. Right. So uh, that's something that we have done ourselves is put, you know, most of our stuff in ocean freight. And then we hoped that we didn't have to send the air shipment, but then, you know, had to end up sending the air shipment so that we could avoid a stock out. That's something to do. Another thing to do, like I mentioned before, is if you have everything going LTL into Amazon, LTL tends to take a longer time to be checked in. So send send most of your inventory LTL, send the rest of it by small parcel delivery, and even have an additional backup plan. The additional backup plan would be something to keep you from stocking out. So this is avoiding stockouts at, at all costs, but if you do tend to stock out, if there is something that happens where Amazon doesn't check your stuff in and you stock out or they lose your stuff and you stock out, what are you going to do in that case. And my suggestion, this is uh, the number one lever to pull. The first lever to pull would be to switch to FBM. So you should have a, a fulfillment center. Don't let Amazon be your only distribution center. And what I mean by that is even if it's your only sales channel, it should not be your only distribution channel. You should be able to take sales from Amazon and fulfill them yourself using a third party fulfillment center. That's something that I have recommended people put in place last year and something that I'm still recommending this year. And I wanted to talk about exactly why that is, why it's important to create a backup distribution channel. Not just will you continue to have your sales, um, your sales moving and you'll be able to take on, you know, albeit it might be a little bit less profitable, but you'll be able to continue to take on sales for, for that product the other thing is that FBM sales do contribute to your sales velocity and do contribute to helping your restock limit uh, levels to stay fairly in place. So they're not going to, they're going to simply take your sales velocity and add to your sales velocity, however much those sales are. So it might be that your restock limits will decrease to a degree because you don't have the prime badge, you may be taking, you know, making less sales, but those sales will contribute to bolstering your restock limits. Uh, that's something that we have verified. Sellers have done this and they have seen that uh, the FBM sales do contribute to the restock, the restock levels. All right. <clears throat> um, if you do have um, trouble finding a fulfillment center, there we have a, a, a warehousing webinar on YouTube uh, that talks about tips on how to pick a good one. I'm not going to get into the details on, on what you should be asking, but there are certain things that you should be doing to make sure that the fulfillment center that you are utilizing um, is a good one. And we do have a list that uh, we can provide to you guys on that as well. All right, the next thing would be to uh, use excess inventory from other SKUs to run a flash sale. So if you run out of stock on a bestseller, uh, or if you're having trouble with a bunch of stale inventory clogging up your, your um, inventory limits, then look at what you have that you are cur is currently acting as a liability to your inventory and try to move it into the asset column and run a flash sale to help to increase your restock limits. So that when your top seller gets back in stock, it can then borrow that sales velocity. So that's where the storage type limits come in handy. With an ASIN type limit, if you stocked out, your restock limits for that ASIN would 
would decrease and it would cause problems where you basically didn't have any way to supplement. But this excess inventory that you have sitting there uh, for other products, if you can run a flash sale, even if you're, you know, say, lowering the profit margin, if you can run a flash sale, uh, you can help to maintain those restock limits. All right, so I want to talk about uh, the different types of ways of clearing out space for restocking. There's a, there's a couple of different things. It's essentially removal orders and then there's flash sales, right? And there's a couple of different ways to run each of these. But the thing to understand is that there's a big difference bet uh, between these two types of uh, removing inventory. And one of them will help to just simply clear space. And the other will help to not only clear space, but also increase sales velocity. And that's what you want to do. Um, you want to try to run flash sales uh, as much as possible. And doing the removal orders would be things where you just don't have enough time to try to run a flash sale, right? The types of removal orders, you've got you know regular removal orders that we're all familiar with. There's also disposal orders, which is in that same kind of category. And then you have uh, the new liquidation program. I'm not going to get too much into the, the liquidation program. We do have a blog post that explains how that works. But the liquidation program is something where Amazon essentially will sell your stuff to a liquidation company and then will pay you uh, a percentage of whatever the liquidation company is able to uh, turn around. All right, the, the idea behind flash sales a uh, flash sale could be anything that helps you to quickly sell through some stale inventory. So you can drop prices, you can do coupon discounts, uh, et cetera. And then also um, there are lightning deals. Lightning deals cost money though. So uh, it may or may not be the best choice for you. And then lastly, you'll wanna check out outlet deals. Outlet deals is another program that Amazon offers, but it's a program that does contribute to your sales velocity. And you can go to your inventory dashboard to excess inventory and see if any of your products do qualify for an outlet deal. <clears throat> All right, uh, now you have uh, temporarily borrowing velocity from other sales channels by switching to multi-channel fulfillment if Amazon is not your current fulfillment center. So this is another thing that adds to your sales velocity. This is something that people didn't realize was adding to sales velocity, but Amazon has gone on record uh, in their webinars as stating that multi-channel fulfillment sales contribute to your sales velocity and help to bolster your restock limits. So this is something that is important to know. If you, for example, run out of your best seller, you might want to divert your sales from say your Shopify account for your other products to Amazon and have Amazon fulfill that. So that's something that you can use to bolster sales when you stock out of your best seller, but it's also something that you can consider doing uh, in the months leading up to Black Friday, for example. All right, so here's where the bonus tip comes into play. <clears throat> and I wanna just make sure that everyone understands uh, multi-channel fulfillment and what we mean by multi-channel fulfillment, it could be Shopify, you know, uh, eBay, Etsy, anything that will fulfill. Now, don't go, don't go fulfilling your Walmart. That actually goes against Walmart's terms of service. So don't go trying to fulfill your Walmart um, sales through Amazon. Uh, Amazon, I think, does have a feature to help you to do that, but it's against Amazon or Walmart's terms of service. So don't consider Walmart as something that you can plug in there. Um, you can get into, in, into some trouble with that uh, on the Walmart side. But uh, multi-channel fulfillment can also be any of those fulfillment orders that you create. For example, you sell inventory to um, a brick and mortar. You can fulfill that through Amazon and that order will then go towards your sales velocity. So those anything that's a fulfillment order will contribute to your sales velocity. Something to keep in mind. All right. That being said, we're going to get into the bonus tip on restock limits, and uh, we'll circle back on any questions that you guys may have. 
uh, that we haven't covered or haven't answered after this. So I wanted to talk about um, this hack that is working for some people. So a couple of weeks ago, I got a message from one of our so stopped users and he was asking about um, if any of our restock limits had increased. And he said that his doubled, his went from 22,000 to 45,000 units overnight. Um, and we're, I was trying to get to the bottom of it. And he said, well, you know, I actually got an email from Amazon explaining why this happened. So he was, uh, he was gracious enough to share the email with me. And this is the email. It came from the multi-channel fulfillment team. And if you'll see here, it says the MCF team has raised your restock limits by 23,420 units. So more than double, he woke up to this email and to this increase. The restock limit increase is valid until September 30th. So that's to the end of the third quarter. Our goal is to increase your restock limits so you can use MCF for your off Amazon business needs. Increasing your MCF sales during this time window will help you maintain higher restock limits before peak season. So the thing that I found very, um, very interesting about this is that Amazon has been claiming that they don't have enough room and they're restricting everyone because they don't have enough storage space. And yet they're offering storage space for other channels, which seems to be counterintuitive to what they're saying until you think about what's in it for Amazon. So Amazon is the number one online retailer, but there are other online retailers that are coming after them with a vengeance. And so they're wanting to maintain that space and they want the information. They want to know what their competitors are doing, how much their competitors are moving. So they are actually giving sellers a benefit by getting, giving them more space so that they will plug into their plug their other channels into Amazon so that Amazon can get that information. It's essentially, it's a big data grab. Amazon is trying to get this information, in my opinion, is trying to get this information about MCF, multi-channel fulfillment, um, how much their competitors are moving. So it's something to that some people have seen on their side of things and are taking advantage of. We've had people write in um, and get uh, an increase based on multi-channel fulfillment. So I'm gonna read you the second part of that um, email and you might want to take notes. There is an email to contact. We've had in the past people try to contact or try to petition for increases and it has not worked before. This has been working for some people. So I will go ahead and show you the other part of that email and <coughs> excuse me. Okay, so the other part of the email goes on to say, if you need higher restock limits to support your off Amazon business, please reach out to multi-channel fulfillment sales at amazon.com and send us a copy of your 90 day unit volume forecast with MCF and FBA projections to request a higher limit. And so we have had other sellers turn around and go do this and request a, a higher limit and get it approved. It's something that, um, yeah, we've had several different people. We've had even people who have reached out to um, the same email at amazon.co.uk and haven't gotten a reply back, but then soon after sending the email, got a 50% increase in their limits. And we've had people get increases in UK, in EU, and... Um, and also in the US, this original one was from the US and there were several from the US that got approved. So I'm not saying that this is something that will work for you necessarily, but um, my, my uh, you know, what I've observed is it's worked for some other people. And my recommendation is even if you don't have a lot of MCF sales, it's asking for MCF plus FBA projections. So getting these two projections uh, my suggestion is it's something that, again, is going to be valid through September 30th, and then they're going to be reassessing it to see if the higher restock limits 
um, are something that should be continued into the fourth quarter. So it's something to, to, to keep in mind to say, okay, here's what my MCF is, but here's what my FBA is. And then from now to the end of September 30th, uh, request a higher limit, send in more inventory. There are a lot of people who are, you know, putting on the brakes on their marketing because they just don't have enough restock limit. So if this buys you the restock limit, use this restock limit, push some sales and increase your, uh, increase your sales velocity during this time so that when the fourth quarter comes around, you can then go back and request um, even more of an increase for fourth quarter sales. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, let me see if there are any questions. Uh, do you think you can do this in the UK? Yeah, like I mentioned, um, try the same email at .co.uk. And like I said, there's a there are a couple, they never got an email back, but there were a couple of coincidental um, increases where they sent an email and then they got an increase even though they didn't get a reply. So it's something that you can definitely, definitely try out by simply changing that last part of the URL. <clears throat> you think Amazon will increase restock limits after they've built more warehouses? Um, I think they, I think they will, I think they need to. And uh, if there are sellers who are losing sales because of what Amazon is doing, they're stocking out. And there's actually something that's very interesting. Um, I didn't throw it up here. It was something that I got the other day and it was, or I, got, I actually got it from the same seller yesterday. And Amazon is actually promoting other products on people's listings. So for example, you're selling supplements. Uh, it might say at the top, this product stocks out quite often. Consider getting a getting one of these products instead. And so because there are supplements that people tend to reorder over and over again, there are, Amazon is now trying to dissuade people from buying your product. So it's something that's very important um, to keep in stock. So even more important is now Amazon is now fighting against you and, and recommending that seller, that buyers buy a product from a competitor because you stock out all the time. You're actually letting them know this product stocks out, it can't stay in stock, so you should buy from someone else. Um, so that's something that is extremely important. But uh, in terms of increasing the restock limits, it definitely needs to happen uh, because you've got a lot of, of good sellers that are running out of stock simply because they don't have enough restock limits. Um, okay, so the question is on this, um, Burhan says, so in order to increase limits for holiday season, we need to provide our projections for sales for third quarter. Yes, and then you need to put your money where your mouth is and, and back up uh, those projections by pushing more sales because they're looking for projections for the third quarter, but then they're going to look at the actual performance during the third quarter for fourth quarter. Um, okay, let me just see. Can we transfer storage type to one another? <clears throat> no, um, storage types are, I mean, the only way to shift in terms of storage type is to change the actual size of your product um, or the type of your product. So you can't necessarily uh, move things into overstock uh, or move them into standard unless you can actually make the packaging uh, fit that. Now, packaging moving into oversize becomes a problem of additional fees, uh, but packaging that moves into standard size, uh, even though it, it might be a, a good idea, um, but it might not be. It'll be less in fees, but at the same time, you go into that more popular uh, bracket. So unless you've got a way to kind of balance that out, you actually it actually has to physically be um, a particular storage type, which is unfortunate and doesn't quite make much sense, right? So let's see, answered live. Um, let's see. Okay. All right, so I wanted to kind of dive into some questions at the end. I do want to cover, um, I did mention that I was going to talk to you about a simpler way to do all of this. We've talked about, you know, uh, your adjusted velocity, 
uh, buffer stock, min-max restocking, organizing your lead times and your transfer times, and then uh, inventory-minded marketing, planning out your marketing and your inventory to be able to actually move in the direction of handling your, uh, your inventory properly uh, between those two teams. And so I would love to introduce you to a, a, a way that you can do this easier and faster. Something that we have set up if you are a SoStock user uh, currently, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. If you are not, I did wanna share a little bit about what SoStock is and what that program is. So we have a program that is a, a, a software um, called SoStock.com and it's a, a customizable and understandable forecasting system. You're able to manipulate da data points on a per SKU basis. Uh, you can add things like sponsored ads, growth strategies, lightning deals, factoring sales spikes, seasonality, stockouts, all of those things that we talked about, min-max restocking, setting your buffer stock, adjusting your lead times. Um, all of this happens uh, with the uh, click of a, a couple of buttons. You're able to generate POs and to track all of your orders. All of those reports that we talked about regarding stockout risk report, uh, liquidation report, our restock, um, our overstock report, all of those reports are able to be uh, created and produced for you so that you can send that to your marketing team. I built so stocked because I was trying to solve my own problems, like I mentioned. Um, and it's something that we are very proud to say has helped a ton of people and uh, is helping uh, even more now today. We have a restock limits calculation. It's something that uh, we are quite proud of because it tends to um, look at what your inventory uh, demand is, how much, uh, how much you're selling for each product, and then does a calculation to figure out uh, across your entire catalog, based on what room you have at Amazon, how much should you be sending to, to Amazon for each and every product to avoid stocking out, right? So this is something that we just launched in the past couple of days and uh, something you can de definitely check out. If you go to sostocks.com, you can look at a demo. There's a little button at the bottom of the website where you can check out a demo on that. The last thing I want to add is that uh, for anyone who signs up to today for So Stocked, um, we are actually, I'm actually offering a free consultation. So one-on-one uh, -on -one inventory management consultation with myself. Uh, if you do sign up for So Stocked today, it's something that uh, we don't offer. Uh, we have onboarding, we have one-on-one -on -one onboarding with our team, but in terms of an inventory management consultation with myself, that's something that we uh, have not been offering. So if you do sign up for SoStock, uh, that is something that you can uh, sign up and uh, do with me as well. And again, like I mentioned, our restock limits forecasting has just been launched. That's a tool that helps you to calculate what to send in based on your utilization and based on the demand for your products. It's a, a complicated formula that uh, it becomes very simple when you click a few buttons and um, it's a way of prioritizing your most important products. So Stocked is available right now for $79 a month for life. And we have been able to help a ton of people. Uh, the price will be going up very, very soon, especially now that we've got our restock limits tool. <clears throat> Just a couple of things from a couple of people who have worked with the software. Uh, these are all reviews that you can find on the Amazon App Store. We've got Persona Creation says that so, so Stock solved 99% of our inventory forecasting challenges. And so they were, uh, they were basically, it was costing them a lot of money to make these mistakes. And they were able to solve, like I said, 99% of their challenges. It says, I highly recommend this tool. Uh, or, and this tool has quickly become a core part of how we do business. We have glorified enterprises said, my weekly inventory uh, from, went from hours down to a few minutes, that's no joke. So they were able to replace Excel spreadsheets and two other pieces of software with this one software. 
the system does everything I need for it. And that an abs the absolute best response of support tickets. We get a lot of people saying that our support is amazing. Uh, we answer on the weekends as well. And um, we, we work with sending videos rather than trying to type in, you know, things. We actually do videos to show you how to use the system and how to make things work within the system. Um, so, and also if you have this, this person has three different warehouses, multiple suppliers, sells in the US, Canada, Mexico, UK, and Europe, and the system will cover all of that. And then lastly, this is from Green Bargains, made thousands more profit with so stock, would not go back to spreadsheets. Uh, Features like ignoring stock out to so sales velocity does, that, does not de decrease. Uh, talking about the accuracy, right? This is a huge, this is huge as it makes sales velocity so much more accurate. We've already made thousands of dollars more profit thanks to so stock and would not want to go back to using spreadsheets. So this is something that we do. So stock is really designed to help people to, you know, uh, improve their inventory planning and I built it because there were no other solutions out there. And uh, so essentially you could do, you know, a couple of different things. You may be using SoSoft already. Um, and if you are not, you could, you know, continue. You could use the principles that I have taught here, uh, hopefully apply them to your, your business and make things a bit better, um, but essentially continue to do the same thing. You could go with one of our competitors, which I personally have found um, that our competitors uh, were not delivering what we were, uh, what I was looking for. That's why I built So Stock. Um, or you can work with So Stock. You can work with us. I can help to, we can help to with our team personally onboard you, get you started with So Stock, uh, especially as we head into the fourth quarter and get you set up on a plan that will actually help to uh, have these great results, like some of these other people are saying. With this, you know, in terms of making more money, avoiding stock outs, that type of thing. So if you have any other questions, um, I'm gonna go ahead and jump into the, the Q&A that we have, the questions. Um, if you have any other questions for me, sostock.com forward slash connect. You can also check out a demo of SoStock, sostock.com um, forward slash connect. There's a demo there. There's a link to all of my socials. There's my email there. You can reach out to me. But let me go ahead and jump into these questions to make sure that um, we answered your questions. Uh, do type in the chat if you did if you did get some value from this. I would be very interested to hear what type of value you got, what your favorite takeaway was. All right, we have. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Is there a way to integrate our inventory? Yes. So I talked about the how to integrate inventory levels into marketing campaigns. So that's something that SoStock does. Um, and I can send out the marketing, the inventory mark minded marketing template for you as well. Could, could you also explain, oh, let me see. <clears throat> What's the best way to take care of velocity when a Amazon inventory reduces? Um, we would do it sales per week and now we're doing sales per day, but it's not really to take care of velocity. Um, not really sure if you're, what you mean about take care of velocity, um, if you mean increasing velocity, I think that uh, a way to supplement that could be one of the ways that we talked about uh, having FBM as a backup would be a way to help increase velocity, even if you can't get your inventory into Amazon. Uh, and then also the MCF sales for any products that are currently sitting in Amazon, I would say would be some of the ways to boost velocity uh, without being able to get inventory into Amazon. Hopefully that answers your question, uh, Akash. If not, then go ahead and clarify it down below. Edward asks, I am about to start my FBM business. For my first order, I am unsure if an order of 200 units or 500, the idea being to hold on to 300 in case the 200 sell fast and save on shipping, which is insane right now. Any guidance? Um, yeah, 200 units seems low to have, especially with the amount of time it's taking. I'm assuming that you're getting your products from overseas. Uh, so I would not want to start with 200. It is going to, you know, you'll say your product takes off pretty quickly, then you don't have any, any inventory available. 
So you might consider, uh, I don't know if you're able to airship over, but you want to know, this is where you want to know what your lead times are and what you can do with that excess inventory if you're not going to move it into um, the marketplace that you're selling in. I would recommend moving it all over or at least knowing how long it's going to take before moving it over because 200 units can go really, really quickly, especially with a launch. Uh, so yeah, it seems very low to me to, to send only 200 units over. Uh, so yeah, get your lead times in order and um, have a way to get that inventory uh, into the marketplace as quickly as possible. And let's see, Amazon reducing stock for sellers. Okay. Amazon reducing stock for sellers. Um, yeah, that's, you know, I, I think we've given some tips on that and more people are seeing an increase in some of these, um, some of the, the stock limits, especially in the UK and in Europe. That's something that recently was happening. So hopefully um, moves in that direction, but uh, I think we gave you some tools for how to increase that. Let's see. Is there a way to... Can we transfer? Okay, we answered that one. Uh, can you, do you think Amazon will increase restock limits? Answer that one. Okay, so Burhan asks, so in order to increase limits before the holiday season, okay, we answered. Last one, any tips on, on seasonal items, how to work those in, into inventory? Yeah, so with seasonal items, and we didn't talk about this too much, but that's part of the daily adjusted velocity as well. Seasonal items, you should be looking at the past time period, and I can actually maybe jump into um, jump into our forecast here. I'll show you kind of how it works inside of yeah <coughs> inside of our forecast. So um, we didn't really get much into it, but we have a, looking at last year's sales. You should be able to look at last year's sales, but again. Uh, when looking at last year's sales, you need to have a way to filter out stockouts and sales spikes, right? Um, ways to, to fil filter out stockouts and sales spikes. So if I scroll down to the bottom, you'll actually see at the bottom that these, uh, every single day is showing the number of units sold per day. And then we get into this area where there's an asterisk, and this is a stockout for this particular product. Uh, so that you can see what happens. An average is cho is selected, a daily sales average is selected for that stock out. So that's what ends up happening um, inside of the system is if there is a, uh, when you are calculating for seasonality, figuring out uh, when you do have a stock out, what that average would have been if you hadn't stocked out. That's something that is important to note is that you should be able to take a, a sales spike or a stock out and replace that with what would have happened if it had been just a normal day uh, for that time period. Um, so that's the first thing I would do would be that you're looking at last year's sales. So let's look at, for example, last year's sales here. If you have any lightning deals planned, you would plug those in. If you have any uh, sales spikes that you think are going to occur on top of that, you would plug those in. And then the last thing that I would suggest is we have something called um, called trend. And so a lot of people will choose seasonality and then they'll add a year to date trend on top. So you can see that the year to date trend for this particular product is a 4% increase. Sometimes it's 20% increase, sometimes it's a 5% increase, whatever it is, you might wanna use that trend increase, that year to date trend increase um, on top of what you had for uh, last year. So it's literally taking last year's sales and then adding a trend on top. <clears throat> and I'm really quickly going to, to plug in, um, let's see, into the chat. Okay, I'm gonna plug in the link for you to sign up for um, so stocks. You're looking to sign up for so stock. I would recommend go ahead and sign up, and then um, and then once you sign up, reach out to me uh, via sostock.com forward slash connect, and then we can set up our one on one uh, our one on one consultation for how to structure your particular 
uh, inventory plan. Last thing I'm gonna grab here, we have a couple of questions in the Q&A. Uh, 30, 60, 90 day adjusted velocity seems best for restocking purposes and last year seems best for forecasting purchase orders. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so um, 30, 60, 90 days is generally what is used. I see a lot of sellers use it um, in private label. In wholesale, it's a little bit different, um, but in private label, uh, I see 30, 60, 90 as the, the general for um, you know, normal, your normal sales period. And then when going into uh, fourth quarter, for example, or if you're a summer product or whatever, whatever is your big sales season, then switching to last year's sales and using a sales trend and then any uh, additional marketing layered on top of that. Uh, and then once that is done, uh, then you place those orders and then you can move back to the 30, 60, 90 days. That was answered. And then how many, how many units should you buy on your first order taking into account Amazon's restock limits? Um, I would go no lower, I think, than 500. Um, generally, it's been, you know, between 500 and 1,000 has been the estimate. Uh, the lead times are getting longer. So you may have to look at potentially uh, producing more and shipping less, uh, if at all possible. But you do need to understand your lead times because right now, especially moving into fourth quarter, um, it might make more sense to ship everything to your final destination, uh, third party warehouse, and then ship things into Amazon uh, for your first order because it's going to be very difficult to get things into the country. It's uh, going to be very difficult to move anything. So you don't want to launch a product, send only half the inventory, and then, and then try to send the rest and not be able to get it into Amazon. So that's something to keep in mind. The answer might have been a little bit different, uh, say, six months ago. But um, as we're moving into fourth quarter, it's going to get harder and harder to get inventory into, um, into whatever country, whatever marketplace. So that's something to, to keep in mind. And again, asking about lead time, asking about um, the reliability of lead times, keeping in mind that uh, you need to talk to your, not only your supplier, but your freight forwarders and your warehouses. Uh, I just would hate for you to not send enough inventory uh, thinking that you would be able to get it in when in fact it becomes more difficult. All right, I think that's it. I think that's all the questions that we have. Um, again, if you have any questions, reach out at sostock.com forward slash connect. I would love to work with you personally and uh, help you with your inventory. Hopefully this was valuable for you. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. All right, bye.